Hey everyone, welcome back to the program. It's mildly familiar in case you forgot. Uh, this episode, we are going to have Mr. Jeff Holiday. I met Jeff in Anaheim, California at VidCon. We were at a Denny's and he came in and took a big handful of mozzarella sticks and I thought, that guy's cool. And uh, yeah, we've been t we follow each other on Twitter and now we're going to talk today on Mildly Familiar. Hand motions are funny funny <laughs> whatever you ever been to a party where everything is going swell and you turn to somebody say i'm gay i hope you're well and they say i Hi everybody, welcome to Mildly Familiar. I'm your host, Gage, and we got Mr. Jeff Holiday here on the seat at long last. How's it going, buddy? Oh, it's going fantastic. I I, I could not be in a better mood lately. Oh, what's been going on with you? Um, just uh just a lot of everything kinda going right. In the middle of the end of the world, um things just seem to be lining up rather well for me and, and for the people in my family. It's kinda nice. Congratulations. Yeah. I wanted to get right to it. I want to get hard-hitting questions. We met at a Denny's about a year ago. We did. And you grabbed a handful of mozzarella sticks that weren't great. They were terrible. Those are quite possibly the worst mozzarella sticks I've ever had in my life. And they were free, too. <laughs> they were free, too, yeah, because nobody else at the table wanted them. And, uh, you know, I am I'm I don't want to toot my own horn or anything. I like to try and be as humble as possible. But I'm a bit of a mozzarella stick connoisseur and... Those were quite possibly the worst I've ever had in my life. Do you have like a a mozzarella stick in the back of your head that you're like, this is the mozzarella stick that is uh, compared to all the rest of the mozzarella sticks? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. Uh, there, there does exist out there somewhere the perfect mozzarella stick. It's not too fancy, but it's also not so completely simplistic that you just kind of forget that you ever ate it. It's got like a, it's got just that little extra pep. And then everything else is, is perfectly perfectly crafted and baked and then fried, flash fried uh, into perfection. Yeah. For sure. You need the right bread to cheese ratio. And, oh, my God, I was at this Wings place the other day, and they, it was like 90% bread and 10% chicken. It was the worst. Oh, my God. Yeah, you can't. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It's... I, I'm, I'm sure there exists plenty of wing places out there where they serve, like, horrible mutant half-breed chickens that you know are like these tiny itty bitty little things they have to pack them up you know yeah yeah i'm a wing connoisseur too big wing connoisseur oh okay so my question to you that i pose to every wing connoisseur is boneless or bone oh bone in all the way that you you don't you don't get the same flavor with the boneless wing and you don't get you don't get the it's like a ritual it's a process by eating these you know and um uh, sure you don't get as much meat so you just eat more wings more wings <laughs> this definitely sounds like a plus in my book yeah <laughs> <laughs> i just called the boneless wing adult chicken nuggets and i just and i'm like eh, they're not technically wings but i'll eat them i usually make that argument as well people get really mad at me though i don't see why there's nothing wrong with tendies yeah, nothing wrong with little chicken nuggies, little chendies. You ever see a bird try and fly without bones in its wings? I haven't, but I don't think it would work very well. That sounds like a penguin. Penguins can swim, they can't fly. This is your Jeff Holiday theory hour. I I guess so. I think penguins I think penguins have bones in their wings too. Birds need bones, damn it. They do. <sighs> hey, we might not agree on a lot of things, but I agree with the bird bones. That's good. What's your favorite breakfast place? And is why is it not Denny's? <sighs> My favorite bre breakfast place is probably a local one here. But if we're talking like a chain, 
I think it is Denny's. Really? Yeah, yeah. So why is your favorite den- breakfast place Denny's? I have very distinct memories of being a kid and going to visit my grandparents. At the time, I lived in a, in a very small little coastal town, and uh, they lived in a much bigger kind of city uh, called Klamath Falls. It's a shitty, dusty hole. Um, but every time we'd go there, we'd end up going to Denny's. And at the time, Denny's in like the late 80s was very colorful. And the Grand Slam breakfast and everything was baseball themed. And my parents had this obsession with wanting me to really like baseball. They never watched baseball, but they wanted me to like baseball. I don't know why. And like if you got the one of the Grand Slam breakfasts, you could get like a little coin, like a little plastic coin and maybe some baseball cards. And I, 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 don't, I don't know. I just like I, I loved the... The mixture of everything together. And the food's not awful. Serviceable. No, no, it's it's eatable. Yeah. Most of the time. It's not mozzarella sticks. There does there does happen to be at times cataclysmic uh mozzarella stick accidents, so you know. But that's okay. There's a certain um feeling. You you study like neuroscience, right? Uh, I did for a very long time before I ended up uh, doing what I'm doing now, yeah. Uh, is is there, like, a specific scientific phrase where if you smell something or you eat something, your mind kind of goes back to where you were, um, like, back when you first had that smell or taste? I think that there is. I don't remember exactly which what the, the scientific term is for it, but one of the reasons why that is is... Uh, are the way we take in sensory data, uh, there are very specific pathways by which they come in to our brain. Um, and one of the most powerful and one of the most basic, like one of the most fundamentally constructed from like very, very basic animal life, mammalian life, uh, is the sense of smell. And that's intrinsically tied to our sense of taste as well. So these are developed very, very, very early on. Um, and they play in part to how powerfully our memories are encoded and our brains work. You ever play, you ever play like Sim city or like city skylines or anything like that? Yes, sir. Okay. So when you have something like some, some little character or, or citizen of a city that needs to get somewhere else, it will take the fastest route possible, even if it's very cluttered and our brains kind of work the same way as well. Uh, the more we exercise certain types of thinking means that it's much more expedient for our thoughts to go that way. It just so happens that when we smell something, we have uh, naturally more dendritic branching that allows our memories to be that much more fast accessible. So that's why like sense of smell will make you remember things much easier. That's fascinating. I, I just called it, like, revertigo, because I heard it one time on a television show, and I'm like, eh, it sounds good enough. <laughs> Can I make an observation? Oh, I know. Whenever I'm around Lily, she just brings out that side of me. <laughs> There's a psychological term for the phenomenon. Revertigo? No. <laughs> Actually, it's associative regression. You see, the neural pathways that... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> revertigo, I like that, actually. That's good. The, the other part of that that's really interesting, too, is that the whole fight or flight thing uh, that that happens when you kind of get shocked by something. Like if you're walking along on a path, and this is the famous example, and you see a wiggly stick on the ground, you might jump because you don't know if it's a snake or not. The reason why this happens is that there are two pathways that our sensory data takes from our eyes. One goes through uh, a very specific grouping of um, brain structures, basically. Uh, and then the other one goes to the prefrontal cortex where we make decision making, our our seat of our consciousness, kind of. The one that goes through the center of the brain through much more simplistic structures are the ones that are encoding for um, aggression, fear. Uh, they're also tied intrinsically to our uh, endocrine system, which controls our hormone release. And so that pathway is actually shorter, physically shorter then going up into our prefrontal cortex. And so we might jump thinking it's a snake before our brain realizes that's a stick. Uh, apparently, the same thing can be said about like eating food and uh, your stomach doesn't tell you that you're full unless it's like 
20 minutes later yes absolutely absolutely and and like we we like to we like to kind of think of our bodies in terms of how we understand machines but they're not machines they're so much more fascinating than machines and in some ways more advanced than machines too um because of the way information is carried through the body and the way in which we we even like can understand what's happening inside of us uh so yeah that's exactly what it is it's all kind of like a weird time delay you know and our body doesn't really want us to necessarily feel full it, it wants us to keep eating because eating is inherently uh, a survival mechanism mm, i never thought of it that way yeah well i mean like in in the most simplistic primordial ways, you know, food is naturally supposed to be scarce, especially for predators, and that's why they have to hunt. Um, so if you see a fat coyote, that coyote is pretty fucking happy, um, <laughs> you know. But uh, he he's probably not gonna be like fat for very long because he's got to get out there and he's gonna have to eat again before all of those calories he stored up start to diminish. So our feeling of being full, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be talking out of turn because this is in my area, um, but from what I understand, our feelings of being full are less about like a sensory of, oh, I can sense that I am satisfied because our bodies don't really work that way. It's more like our organs are being displaced. We are uncomfortable kind of shit, you know? Right. It's not like pain where it immediately goes to the brain. Right, right. It's It's like a totally... It's a totally separate kind of sensation that's kind of like secondary sense data. It's not a it's not a sense data that's like specifically designed to be like stop eating. You know, it's more a oh <laughs> that's not right. We have officially done too much. Okay. Just real quick, I'll get off the breakfast stuff. But that's fine. favorite breakfast food real quick. Ooh, I mm, damn. Okay, I do. I love I love biscuits and gravy. Mm. I'm a big biscuits and gravy guy. Uh, however, if I'm gonna make breakfast, I usually will just put like a bed of hash browns, some over medium on top, a bunch of hot sauce. And I'll just wolf that down. You're a man after my own heart. What hot sauce do you use? These days, just for for ease of, of use, I just use Tapatio because it's good. Um, but uh, I, I, if I have the opportunity to, I like trying out exotic hot sauces. Big hot sauce guy. What about you? Hot sauce? God, I can't remember the name. It's right in my kitchen, too. I gotta... I, I need to look this up real quick because it's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> it's... it's... I keep wanting to say Chipotle. Cholula? Cholula. Yeah, yes, that's it. That's yeah. the one. With the little with the little wooden cap and everything, yeah. Wooden cap and the lady on top. That lady seems very inviting. She's like, hey, you're going to have some hot sauce today, and it's going to be a little rough at first, but it's going to be all good later. We're going to make your breakfast just a little bit more fun. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Oh, my God. You should, you should do, um, what's it, like? cereal commercials we're gonna make your breakfast a little more fun <laughs> um yeah <laughs> the only the only other one that i i try and have um like if i'm gonna go out to eat for breakfast at like a greasy spoon i really like to get chicken fried steaks because i will never make a chicken fried steak at home who who has the time yeah i mean <laughs> I don't think I've had a chicken fried steak now that I think about it. I've always seen that on the menu. I'm like, ever? I don't think so. No. Because I look that on the menu. I'm like, eh, I'd rather have pancakes or waffles or whatever. Oh, sure, sure. If I'm not, I like, I don't even know what meat, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what meat chicken fried steak is. Um, is oh, <laughs> country fried steak. It just says cutlet. Cutlet doesn't mean anything. Is it chicken? I don't think it's chicken. I think it's beef. Jimmy, put it up on the screen if it's beef or not. All right, there we go. Jimmy figured it out. Yep. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm I'm looking too. I'm I'm so curious now. Um, oh man, this is driving me crazy. Yeah, no, it's not chicken. It's not chicken. It's beef. Why would they put chicken in the name then? It's made well. So it's basically it's like a cube stick, but they cook it uh, like they would make a uh, fried chicken because they bread it. 
and then they fry it and then they cover it in gravy and there's just no this i mean it's good it's good but i mean it's it's really bad for you so i probably shouldn't eat it as much as i want to hey whatever makes you happy my dude Lots of things make me happy that I shouldn't do, so... Okay, that enough said, buddy. Mm. Also, I wanted to ask, um, your YouTube channel, how exactly would you pitch it to, like, a grandma or something? Because I, I watched a couple videos, and I'm like, I'm not sure how I would describe this to someone. I usually describe it as uh, uh, debunking. Uh, debunking dangerous pseudoscience, bad medical practices, a little bit of cults, uh... And he swears a lot. <laughs> right. There's. You should make a second PG version channel where you uh, dub over yourself. And then you can make it for kids. Mm -hmm. I could do it with like... Uh, Giggly cartoon voices and whatnot. Although, you know, a kids content on YouTube isn't monetized anymore. So that's... Uh... Oh, is it, is it not? No, not really. Not really. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking that if you could put stuff specifically made for kids, you would get more money out of it. That would be nice. I got student loans to pay, so I'm like, mm, mm. <laughs> You recently did a documentary on a certain convention, correct? I did, yeah. What What are some of your documentary influences? Because I've been watching a lot of documentary now, and I took a class in documentary in college, so I, I think I'm basically an expert. He wasn't. <laughs> um i don't know i uh i i just kind of I've, I've been absorbing them as much as i can trying to but when i'm when i'm watching documentaries these days because what i did with the cal gem video was very very small it was very quick and brief and uh as much as it took time to put it out it's not as much as i want to do and i want to do more so i've been studying documentaries and i don't necessarily like I don't even necessarily take in the message as much anymore. I'm sitting there and I'm like watching how it works, like how they put everything together, how the B-roll works, how they're doing their transitions. Like the technique. Yeah, I'm totally obsessed with just studying technique and what works and what doesn't. Um, and by, here, uh, the worst part is, if not for the current pandemic that we're dealing with, I would actually be traveling right now working on the big documentary. If I may ask, is it international or is it, domestic i was gonna have a tier depending on how much crowdfunding i got uh it would have been very affordable to do it domestic uh as long as i was willing to like space it out and get good deals on flights um, but i did want to do international i wanted to go there was two people i wanted to talk to in england and one person i wanted to talk to in australia hopefully that will happen eventually yeah i haven't been either place we'll see with the current pandemic i know they're not letting us out of the country right now we're kind of stuck here for a while one of my friends is moving to taiwan and i i don't know how they're doing that i think they're just moving and staying there yeah my little brother not by not by blood but basically my little brother um he is a teacher in china and when this all started happening they had to evacuate him to japan and then eventually back to the states and now he's stuck here and his girlfriend's in china oh no and he's like he's like tearing his hair out right now trying to get back in i would be too but there's there's a process that he's he's in a list he's on a list uh to get back in um whenever they start to process them again but it's gonna take him like a month to get there he'll have to go down to san francisco go into isolation for two weeks then fly over and then be in isolation for two weeks, and then he can go back to work. Uh, I, I had the same thing where <laughs> I had to go to Florida just to visit family, and I, I had to quarantine myself for two weeks. And it's 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 not as fun as people like to say it is. No. 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 <laughs> I went a little crazy, but we're, we're here now. We, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I also wanted to ask if you had any favorite documentaries, speaking of which. Ooh, no. <laughs> um, I, I, I <laughs> hate used them to. all. <laughs> yeah, I used to. Uh, I used to have quite a few favorite documentaries. Um, back in the day, I was a huge Michael Moore fan. Right. Yeah. And I, I still, I really like uh, the way he puts together and he produces his stuff. Um, then for like a short period of time, I really was not a big fan of Michael Moore. I don't know how I feel about him now. I haven't I haven't really like gone well, I don't 
I don't know if it's necessarily the man of the art that I would I would uh, have a problem with. I don't think I'd have really a problem with most of his documentaries. Although I haven't seen any since, what was it? Fahrenheit 9-11. Yeah, that was way, way back when. Because he did, he did another, he, he did another Fahrenheit movie, like Fahrenheit 11 something. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see that one. Yeah, I, I think it was just from the 2016 election and I'm like, I don't, I don't need to know more about this. It's, it's, I, I've been bombarded enough. Lived through it. Yeah, you know, there's just, <laughs> there's so much noise. I, you know, the thing is too. I got a lot of steam to blow off when it comes to politics these days. So I've just, I, I've decided, because it, it, it gets to you after a while. And like, I, 100%. I, I got stuff I got to do. And like, I, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to, to battle dangerous medical practices and anti-vaxxers and things like that. So I've just, anytime I get really cranky about politics and everybody's like bombarding me with it, I just go over and I record some like ranty video and throw it on my second channel and be like, nah, I don't care, whatever. There you go. <laughs> That's probably really healthy. I I hope so. I it's it's better than keeping it all in and then having it explode on someone. True, very true. Um, cause I'm a pretty nice guy, uh, but like anybody else, you know, I get I get impacted by things that are like very negative, uh, out in the world, and I am not somebody who ever bottles things up. So, like I'm very I'm very honest. I'm very open. Um, I'm very abrasive with people too, uh, but I I tend to see that really as a as a positive, um, but it it means that I need outlets to express myself. Is that what happened on uh, Cal Jam? Is that you uh, you talk to these people and then you would vlog about it later? Yeah, yeah, that that's a lot of what happened with it. Um, when uh when in the footage of the the Cal Jam video. Uh, there's even there's way more footage too that I never got around to, to putting out, which I am going to. I'll make a, a follow up video here soon. I would kind of get it out a little bit through his testimonials, but I also did three uh, live streams on my Twitch while I was at Cal Jam, um, mm. and they were basically like emotional support streams where I I had I couldn't let anybody know what I look like, so I had the camera right. pointed at the wall, you know. Um, but I was just talking to the chat like, this is really messing me up, man. This is really hard to pretend I'm somebody that I'm not. You also said something real that really stuck with me in the documentary. Like, you talk to a certain person and you're like, oh, they're a really nice guy at the end of the day. And I think that's a beautiful way of kind of distinguishing, like, the person from the beliefs because, you know, people are divided nowadays. True, yeah. And it was the it was the strangest one. Um <clears throat> Uh, they, most of the most of the like the wing nuts that I'd made videos on before, they were pretty much as I pictured, you know, uh, kind of pompous, mm -hmm. kind of full of themselves. Uh, this is their time to be like a big name celebrity, and you know what, right. whatever. But it was the doctor from Infowars, Edward Group, who was really? just the nicest guy in the world. Is he abrasive on Infowars? No, 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 no. But he's, he just, what he, the thing, I, I think, I think he's actually a true believer. I think he really believes all the crazy shit that he, that he says and he promotes on there. I, I don't think like there's a malicious bone in that guy's body. I think he just really thinks that this stuff is real. And, uh, you know, and on the, on the show on Infowars, he's, very matter of fact he's like you know and this is gonna be good for trying to combat the neuro damage from vaccines you know and blah 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 blah. and he's yeah he's not abrasive he's just <laughs> wrong you know <laughs> but sweet guy real sweet guy we had great conversations mm -hmm. probably the most intense guy i met though while i was at that documentary um filming that documentary at cal gem was uh the guy who drives the vaxxed bus. I didn't even know there was a vaxxed bus. Yeah, they have this giant RV that they drive around the country, and they've actually put it on a ship and taken it to other continents uh, before. And on it are just names of people who believe that their children were harmed by vaccines. Um, which, I mean, it's possible that some of them maybe have, like, a very small percentage. But, like, you know, it's... It, when you get into like anti-vaxxer stuff it gets really wild but um this guy there's a whole story behind him where he got kind of recruited to to drive the bus and then he got in the process of that and hearing all these testimonials from people got converted into like a true believer and talking to him 
was kind of spooky. He was a nice guy too. Very nice. I'm not trying to like disparage him at all, but he 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 sounded like how you would picture a Scientologist talking, right? Like he's so 100% on board with everything, with everything. Mm. Like the anti-vaxxers could murder a baby in front of him and he'd be like, yes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Go off. <laughs> Woo, you know? And like, Just to get it out, out front, vaccines, do they cause autism? Nope. Okay, cool, yeah. Interview over. We did yep. it, Reddit. All right. <laughs> Pack up for the day. We're good. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, that one I that one I knew way even before I got into like doing what I do now. Uh, because before I got into YouTube, before I started going to school, um, I worked for on and off for about seven or eight years at a group home for adults uh, with autism in crisis. So what this meant was. Uh, these were profoundly autistic people who were at least 18 or older. Uh, profound autism is in they usually don't talk, and if they do talk, they barely talk and have very specific actions, you know? These are heavily autistic people. Um, and in crisis, meaning that they had displayed uh, tendencies towards extreme violence. So this is a crisis house, and uh, I worked there off and on for a long, 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 long time. And I got to understand autism quite well. I got to uh, see it and, and learn techniques and strategies for dealing with autism, um, de-escalation procedures. But in the process of it, uh, there was the question that came up about vaccines. And I always found it fascinating because uh, my one of my uh, clients, he and his brother were both autistic and they were children of a woman who was a hippie, because I live in Eugene, Oregon. There's a lot of hippies. And she never vaccinated. Oh, so it was like almost the opposite effect of what people. Were I mean, saying. it just it's just in, it's just so inconsequential. Like the the thing, it's so when we when we had the height of our vaccination schedule, I think we were getting it upwards to like the 96, 97 percent of people in the country are vaccinated. So when people are trying to find like mm -hmm. some reason why their 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 child is autistic well that's a really easy scapegoat because well was your child vaccinated well yeah well, that might have been it well i mean everybody's vaccinated what are you talking about <laughs> right it's like saying does he have two hands right exactly yeah maybe it was the, maybe it was that extra hand that did it i don't know <laughs> um but the, you know and it's i have all the sympathy in the world for people who have autism in their homes Right. Um, and who have autism in their families, you know, I, all the sympathy in the world. And, uh, I, I very much highly encourage, uh, the, the further research into it, but it's, it's very clear. It's not vaccines. It's very clear. A lot of nut jobs out there. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, there's quite a, there's quite a few. There's quite a few. I just wanted to. Uh, ask you about the documentaries Going Clear and uh, Behind the Curve. Have you seen those? Oh, I saw Going Clear. I haven't seen Behind the Curve yet. Um, yeah, I saw Going Clear. You know, I I'm I'm kind of sort of friends with Ron Miscavige. Sure. What? Why? <laughs> uh, so he's the father of David Miscavige, the guy who runs the Church of Scientology. Um, mm -hmm. So his father escaped because like. His son had put him in this fucking him and his him and and at the time his his wife in this fucking compound out in the fucking desert and shit and they had to Jeez. escape yeah real spooky uh, but since then he's like he's gone around he's been just kind of doing this tour of like talking to people about Scientology and promoting his book um, which is a really good book uh, and yeah he's a he's he's a real interesting guy he's a really nice dude he's had me on his show. And that was pretty cool. Just to make sure, he's he's anti Scientology, right? Oh yeah. I would assume if you escaped <laughs> for Scientology, you wouldn't be too keen on it. Yeah, no. He, um, him, and Leah Romani, and like a bunch of other people who uh, who escaped are like the outspoken people who have been who've been blowing the whistle on all this stuff, and that's how we know. I mean, I don't remember who exactly it was. It was before it was before Ron got out. It was before Leah too. But somebody who was pretty high ranking first got out, and that was how we learned about the Lord Zenu, 
and like the alien oh soul God. stuff. Nobody knew anything about that. But it was operating like that for over 25 years of them believing this kind of crap, you know, and nobody had any clue. Can you, can you, can you imagine, can, ah, can you even imagine, can you even imagine, can you even imagine, like, like, so you, you, you fall in with this, this group and they're like teaching all this self-help stuff and you're like, yeah, this is great. This is cool. I really like it. You know, I can, ha I can be a Scientologist and I can be normal and like live my everyday life. And I just happen to have this group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do our auditing and sure they ask for money, but every church asks for money. No big deal. And they're like, all right, you've attained the next level. It's time for you to know the truth. Actually, we're all a bunch of reincarnated demon souls from a bunch of gold 747s that flew down thousands of years ago and dropped a bunch of aliens into a fucking volcano at the behest of the evil Lord Xenu. Oh, man, they they go from zero to a hundred real quick, man. Right there, right there. It's the craziest thing when you start studying like the levels of Scientology, and then all of a sudden it's just right at that level. It goes. <laughs> this might not be their exact thought process, but they're like, "Well, I did spend a good amount of time and money to get here, so yeah, of, I think of course this this has to be true, or else I'm an idiot for spending the time and money." Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what most of them say too. It's so wild. Like, I'm so invested in this. I mean, <laughs> okay. Whew. But yeah, if you have time, check out Behind the Curve on Netflix. It's. I will. Yeah, it's a wonderful, true insight about the Game of Thrones walls that surround the flat earth. Oh, man. Oh, no. Yeah. It's a. Oh, God. Yeah, it's it's a, one of those flat earth things, and people are very enthusiastic about talking about it and then they have scientists in the very next clip being like well actually you can disprove this by going online and just looking at these flight patterns you know that flat earther who died recently i did not i i don't i don't really follow a lot of the flat earth stuff because i it there's so many of my buddies who make youtube youtube videos they already cover flat earth so i don't bother mm -hmm. but I, I i because of like the circles that i operate in i always hear all about it there's this wild guy who kept making these rockets and he would jump onto the rocket with a parachute on and he'd launch himself up on this man-made rocket and then parachute down because he's trying to see the curve, right? Uh-huh. Dude's a lunatic, an absolute lunatic. Yeah, th I was about to say that's and Wiley Coyote. Shit. It looked like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> it was bizarre. It's uh, like if you can find a picture of his of his of his his rocket, like it's just the silliest thing. And then uh like he he was supposed to do it I don't know. I want to say like six months prior to him, Tim dying, he was supposed to do or something like that. And he had a failure and it didn't work. And it was like, Oh, okay. And then finally <clears throat> he got his biggest rocket yet, got the thing to launch and off he goes up into the air. And there's a video of it. <laughs> and then you lose sight of him. He's gone. He's <laughs> strapped to a rocket somewhere up there. Oh, okay. So he never came down. Oh no, no, no. He, he, he came down. Mm -hmm. I we I don't know I don't know if they ever found out if like his parachute failed or if he like lost consciousness and couldn't pull it or something like that. Right. Uh, but no, he he came back down to earth. Gravity's real, and he passed <laughs> away uh, on impact. I thought it was going to be like an Amelia Earhart situation where it's like, yeah, we don't know where his body is. <laughs> Some say he's still going to this day. <laughs> he's circling the curve. I uh, yeah. <laughs> I love I love the idea though that this crazy guy who dedicated his life to trying to find out this truth one way or the other um you know and and that's the kind of passion that I think we should all hope we get even a taste of um for life oh my god I, yeah. I like to think you know in that in a while uh I, I like to think that right right before he blacked out or whatever happened when he got to that apex he finally got high enough that he actually saw that curve and he's oh. like <laughs> shit shit oh. well i'm not pulling the parachute this time that maybe that's what it was maybe that's there what it go. was he saw it he's like oh <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna leave it whatever it's fine jeff thank you so much for coming on but my last question is going to be what have you been doing in quarantine um i got really lucky uh that when I got sick with what I believe is the coronavirus back in early March, mm -hmm. uh, two other families in my area also uh, got sick with the exact same symptoms, the exact perfect description of symptoms. 
So the three families, we all uh, decided to quarantine together. Mm -hmm. And we actually have been having a great time. You know, we have our our barbecues. We go camping. That's awesome. We do that kind of stuff. And we train with weapons. Lots and lots of guns. (laughs) Lots of guns. This might be a controversial opinion, but guns, Mm -hmm. they're pretty fun. They're if mm. used in a safe and responsible way, they're really fun. They are really fun, uh, and and the part and parcel of it is, is, guns are part of American culture, for better or worse. For better or worse, mm-hmm. we we can't really like remove them from our culture at all. So the best thing that we can do, is to uh, teach each other how to use them safely as much as possible. Teach people respect of a weapon, uh, how it operates, mm-hmm. so everybody is, is well aware. Uh, and then, you know, if you enjoy them, safe places and safe ways in which to enjoy them. Go out for target practice and plinking. Yeah, that's perfectly reasonable in my mind. If they're here to stay, we might as well use them safely. Right, exactly. I, I, I as much as, like, I'm pretty pretty much a city guy these days, I, my, I, was, I was raised in the woods. I'm kind of a green neck, you know, a little bit. Where are you from? Uh, or Oregon. I was raised oh, okay. in, in, born and raised in Oregon, but, uh, lots of woods, lots of beautiful places out here. And my dad, my dad taught me gun safety and how to shoot when I was six years old. Wow. All the way going up. I, I have shot a clay disc out of the sky, so you, you nice. might, you might not want to mess with me. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Got that accuracy. <laughs> Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, uh, it's been my pleasure. I, I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun talking to you, a lot of fun learning with you. And now I'm a little more familiar with Jeff Holiday. Hell yeah. Jeff, uh, do, you, do you have anything you want to say or plug to the people? Um, vaccinate your kids. Ooh, ooh, we're going to have to cut that out. Or it's too controversial, man. <laughs> well, you know me. I'm all controversy. Guys, Jimmy, cut. Cut, cut the feet.